Let's do one last one. Um, how are you, Michael? I'm very good, thank you. Very good. Been a beautiful day. Hasn't it just, but it's somewhat, um, you know, God's playing an awful trick on us Brits, isn't he? Because we're all locked down and fundamentally the weather has been gorgeous. I know, I know, but I'm lucky because I have a garden. So I'm, I'm spending a lot of time locked down in my garden. Uh, and where, where is your garden? Where's home for you? Um, I'm in uh, southwest London. I'm mm. within hearing distance of, uh, of the All England Wimbledon. When, when the tournament's on, I can sit in the back garden and hear the roars. So I know when something exciting's happened and I can nip in and see what it is. It's, you, love, you live in a lovely bit of the world. Um, so obviously we've spoken before and uh, you were a total hit on, um, on, our, on our Dum De Dum. Uh, interview that that we did uh, so you're back by popular demand sir oh. you know um all of a sudden alistair has gone from being the invisible man of ambridge to uh, the most desirable bachelor um what it's a, a full circle it's a full circle yeah. because there was a time long ago when he mm -hmm. first came into ambridge he I, I i remember this he was described as the most eligible man in borsetshire and i thought this is something i'll take to the grave <laughs> um, and uh yeah then it all sort of changed didn't it i'm sure we'll go into that but it, it's it's you know these cycles happen it's the nature of soaps in a way i think that characters tend to get used a bit according to what the storylines need and so characters change quite quickly as i'm sure everybody knows who listens and watches other soaps um and uh, yeah, I mean, yes, it's been nice that he's 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 bloomed a little in the last couple of years. Has has resurgence? Obviously, before um, Shula gave you the heave ho, um, there was word that you the, you must have been told that that was that was going to happen. Probably not. I no, mean, you weren't. Told. You mean by? You were probably told. Uh, um, no, I think. I think. I mean, most of what we hear is when we open the scripts. It's when we get the script sent to us. It, it, occasionally, that that's different. I, I the um, the Jim storyline last year. Uh, the three mm -hmm. of us, Jim, Jazza, and, and Alistair, or well, the three actors, were taken into Jeremy's office to be briefed in in what was going to be coming up. Um, but that's the first time in 22 years that I've had a conversation about storylines before, uh, well, a formal story, a formal conversation about storylines. Occasionally really? someone on the floor, one of the producers will, will sort of say, oh, well, such and such is, is, is in the pipeline. But more mm. often than not, you, you get a script and there's sort of indications. I didn't know, you know, it was very obvious that the marriage was on the rocks but I had no idea where it was going. Even as we were doing the scenes with the, mm -hmm. with, you know, Shula putting a foot and saying, right, that's it, you're off. I didn't know what, what was going to happen next. So, but I'm, if you generally didn't know what was happening next, I think surely then Michael Lumsden, the actor, must have had a certain amount of trepidation. Did you think, well, you know, you're going to be for the heave ho? It, it, yeah, you know, it's a possibility. It's, um, I mean, it's something we live with. I, I have I have seen uh, other actors be written out of the Archers um, where they didn't really know until, you know, pretty much when the scripts arrived. Occasionally got a phone call a day or two before that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, if you've got a storyline where suddenly there, there is a clear path which might mean you're leaving, yeah, you think about that. Um, I think I think without anybody actually telling me what was going to happen next, I think I did get a few sort of little nods and winks that mm. the plan was not for Alistair to leave. But I've also seen incidents where people have been given the plan and then maybe it's ended up taking another route and, and the plan has ended up being quite different. So, yeah, it's it's, um, you know, you, you're never quite sure. And it must be made even more 
kind of uncertain when you have a different regime, a different kind of script editor, you know, and they're going to have different thoughts and feelings about the whole direction of the whole show. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I mean, you know, I feel I feel that's affected Alistair a lot in in um, in terms of the attitudes of of um, various editors since uh, Vanessa left, who was obviously there for about the first 15 years or so that um, I was in the program. Um, and I mean, the best news for me is that Jeremy, who's running it now, uh, is, is, in, is particularly interested in, in the character. I mean, if not the character, then he's particularly interested in the, the um, uh, what that relationship of Jim and Jazza and Alistair brings to the programme, which, which is lovely. And it's an absolute joy. You know, we, we have such fun doing, doing all those scenes. And um, yeah, personally, it's obviously, it's given, it's given me a whole kind of new impetus in doing it because uh, suddenly having all those different um, energies coming mm -hmm. into, the, into my life as an actor within the programme has just been lovely. So be honest, right? You know, you were. I know you're going to you're going to ask me difficult questions, aren't you? I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. This is a very easy one. Obviously, you were Ambridge's forgotten man for years. You know, you just you were literally just were like a voice off. You weren't ever quite a silent. But after you had that brush in with uh, with gambling, it almost felt like you were silent. And then all of a sudden, you said horse paintings. Um, how does it feel now to be Ambridge's sex symbol? <laughs> Oh dear, dear, dear! If only. Um, I, I, the point has yet to come where I feel that. You, I'm, you I'm enjoying listening. All I'm enjoying is is uh, is that he has got a new lease of life, and and um, and that I'm getting to do some different stuff. There were years and years and years when, uh, you know, a huge amount of what I did in the program when I was in there was uh, quite similar stuff with Shula, you know, clearly a, a relationship that wasn't kind of very satisfactory. A, a lot of scenes that we felt, both of us felt we were sort of replaying similar scenes over and over again. Um, and it, it just seemed a shame really. Um, and now I'm just so excited that uh, that he's kind of having been released from that that marriage. Um, the, the the possibilities are completely open. It's great. There's it's not. I mean, the Jim Jim and Jazza thing is is lovely, but actually, there could. I'd, I've no idea what might happen. I don't think anybody has at the moment because the, everything's in such turmoil. Well, no one would wish Shula on anybody. So I, I'm, I'm happy for you, I sir, that, you. that you're out of that, that you're out of that. Um, let's go back. Um, the, when I think of the character of Alistair, I think of specifically two big storylines. There was you and gambling. And then what? the one which resonates with me, which a lot of Archers fans won't even know was uh, you were quite big on the old Ambridge Extra and Daniel's girlfriend made a total play for you, didn't she? Um, from, from, from an actor's point of view, um, how did you approach both of those storylines? Let's deal with the gambling first because everybody that, well, not everybody, because it depends when you, when you started listening to the Archers, but um, listeners of a certain vintage will remember that and the fact that it put the whole uh, your whole marriage with Shula in jeopardy. and But she did come through for you, didn't she? So um, remind us of the basics of that storyline and then maybe tell us, you know, how you portrayed that uh, from an actor's point of view. Okay. Um, there's a few things that come to mind. Um, my memory, and this is a long time ago, uh, and, you know, it's it sort of, I can't guarantee I'm being entirely accurate about this, but my memory is that what drove Alistair to get to get into gambling and then get hooked on gambling was um, when David and Ruth 
decided to take on another vet for their specialist herd. Mm. And Alistair was suddenly kind of sidelined from, from the family uh, and, and felt that he wasn't valued. Um, and and it, that reminds me, you talked about earlier about how does it feel when you don't know whether you're going to be, um, is the storyline going to maybe take you out of the programme or whatever? I actually, in, on that occasion, had the experience of walking into the uh, green room. It would have been at Pebble Mill, I guess. Um, and Judy, who plays Schuler, introducing me to a man I'd never met before who was sitting in the green room and saying, oh, Michael, come and meet Richard, the new vet. Oh, wow. That's, that's quite a shock. <laughs> um, and of course, you know, I didn't know the storyline. I didn't know where it was going. So, um, you know, that, those sort of things are quite, quite tricky. It was lovely. He was a lovely guy. And the storyline actually ended up, you know, with um, Alistair staying on and, and all the rest of it. But um, interesting moments. Um, in terms of the gambling, it, it, it's, it was good for, for me uh, in terms of, you know, having something to hook on to. Um, I was, if I had reservations about that storyline, it would be that, I guess, I mean, I have a, I, I actually have a little bit of a history with the horses myself, because at one time in my life, I worked for a, um, a company doing commentaries, doing horse race commentaries. Um, and uh, I, I have always kind of quite enjoyed going to the races and all that sort of thing. But um, his gambling was late night sitting in front of a computer, clicking on things and it, it, it was it was sort of a sad gambling um which is probably better for the story but in terms of Alistair and de character development it felt like it, it a little bit like you know here he is in in a in the marriage that is kind of not very exciting and now he's going down a a, a rock Oh, Michael. Uh oh. Um, I'm guessing that everybody can still hear me. Just nod your heads if you can still hear me. Yes. All right. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Eleanor, as iPad, and Dave Harding. Um, let's just see where we are with Michael. Did, did, did you lose me there? Oh, yeah, we did. We did. There you go. But you're back. So oh, cutting uh, yeah. away. Yeah. Uh, if you rewind 30 seconds and I think I think we'll be fine. Okay. I, was just, I was just saying it was I, I think a, a part of the problem was that actually it's quite hard to dramatize sitting in front of a laptop gambling. Mm -hmm. You know, the actual act was not very dramatic. It was it was, you know, I can remember scenes where Shula would come in and find him sitting at the computer. And we, we used to say, well, how do we actually let the audience know that this is what you're doing and, and that maybe you've been doing it for hours? And actually the sound of somebody clicking um, the return key on a laptop is, is not all that exciting. Uh, so there we go. That, 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 was, that was my sadness about that storyline, that it, that it um, it, it potentially felt like it could have been dramatic in a different way. It was only dramatic in that it was, it created tension in the marriage and all that sort of thing. But the actual, what I was doing uh, didn't feel very dramatic. Do you think that your separation then divorce from Shula was, you know, with the seeds were planted back then because even though she came through with, for you and said yes we're going to remortgage the stables you know to pay, pay off your gambling debts I'm, if I'm remembering back there was a time when you know things did seem in jeopardy it wasn't necessarily the case that she's gonna you know come to your rescue so to speak or do you think this is just something which was more 
um, the whim of the new story editor. And he said, no, it's let me you, you mentioned that Radio 4 Extra story. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we both, Judy and I, found it very, very strange that we did that whole story where Daniel's girlfriend took a sort of became slightly obsessed with Alistair and, and followed him around and, and became sort of work for him and then started um, to, to uh, behave well, behave inappropriately and, and, and eventually get him to almost behave inappropriately. Um, and the, and the marriage almost broke up then in the, in Radio 4 Extra. Mm -hmm. uh, Alistair. Oh, you're right because she, she threw him him out. Yeah. In that storyline. But that storyline was never referred to in The Archers. There was no, uh, until some years later when there was a, a, a few passing references to it which I thought was slightly odd because the storyline hadn't happened in the Archers at that time. It hadn't been mentioned in the Archers. So anyone who was a regular Archers listener and didn't listen to radio to um, Ambridge Extra wouldn't have known uh, what those references were about. And I think in a way that that's when the, the real seeds were, were, were planted, even though they did recover from it within that storyline um i think that's when trust kind of completely collapsed between them and from then on it may have been repaired but it was never i don't think it was ever very solid mm. okay so let's go back to the, the the late 90s um what were you doing before you got that call that um the archers needed a new hunk in the village um, I think I'm trying. To, oh, I don't remember exactly what I was doing. I don't. I, I was doing quite a lot of radio in Birmingham at the time. Uh, I used to. I used to do quite a lot of those epic. I think it was Monday nights. Might have been Sunday nights. Mm -hmm. And the Radio Four would always do a sort of two-hour um, full-length radio play. And we used to do some fabulous. Um, so it's a great thing about radio. You can just sort of, we, we did plays set in, um, in the Crusades. Um, I, I, I played medieval troubadours and it's so great because you don't have to sing. Um, they just play <laughs> someone else's voice when it came to the singing bit. Uh, and I didn't have to do silly miming or anything because the audience just hear the voice. Um, so, uh, and I used to absolutely adore doing those. Is but, that? Do you feel more comfortable doing uh, radio work as opposed to visual? You know, wh wh where's your comfort zone as an actor? Well, we've had this conversation before, and it, um, um, my comfort zone. Oh, I, I absolutely adore radio, and and uh, and it probably is the most comfortable place um, because it, it is quite joyful to do radio. I don't, I, I don't know why. I think it's possibly because. It's not that it's not stressful. You you still have to when the green light goes on, you've got to be on on the ball and you've got to get it right. And time is usually very short. Um, so th there is a certain amount of of stress involved. But the fact that you you know you don't have to learn the lines, um, it, particularly with the archers where you're with chums you know you you get together and you're you're meeting up with you, with your pals um mm -hmm. it's it's just it's just a great pleasure to do it and but it, it, the conversation we had before i remember you know my heart is in theater mm -hmm. and i've done i've done a huge amount of theater since i started and i still do whenever i possibly can um because that now that is stressful but it's also what it's all about that is for me that's that's the that's what that's why i became an actor and it still is why i would why i want to carry on now michael you said something kind of interesting you said that when you go and work on radio um you feel like you're you know with your chums with your pals is that honestly? you're gonna say you're gonna say are there any people you don't get on with oh. 
far bit from me to so telegraph my thinking, sir. But well done. Well done. <laughs> you are? No. You are? No, no, no. no. And if there were, you're not going to say. Yeah. Right? But is it really true that you are like a band of brothers, you know, people on, who, who are doing the archers? Do you feel there's a special click, a special, you know, a special bond between you, you know? Because it's only, what, three, four days a month which you guys actually go up and meet, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. It, it's, it would be hard to say that's entirely true because we see each other so little. Because you only see the people in, in the particular episode you're recording and maybe you cross with the people who've just finished recording and the people arriving to do the next episode, you, you, you're only seeing a very tiny number of other cast members every time you go in. But, but it is a big family. And I mean, it's been lovely, actually. There's a, we have a WhatsApp group, which used to be quite small, but since lockdown's happened, it's expanded massively. Um, and it's been absolutely beautiful I mean it's it's been incredibly supportive people looking out for one another people coming up with ideas to uh, keep you busy people coming up with ideas for things we can do for charity I might mention um, I've just read uh, one minute or so of Alice in Wonderland for uh, um, to help raise money for the um, NHS charities and something like I think 150 voiceover uh, voice actors have recorded a minute each of Alice in Wonderland, and it's being released in five-minute chunks. I'm trying to remember what the uh, website is. I think it's Wonderland Challenge, but um, uh, I think on Monday that's going to sort of go live and be. And a lot of Archers actors have, have done that, and that came through the WhatsApp group. Actually, one person knew about it mentioned it on the group lots of other people got involved um no that's that is absolutely true and, it, and there is a sort of there's definitely a bond and i asked charlotte the same question right and this is a little bit i was gonna say indelicate i don't know if it's really that indelicate but obviously you're an actor of some vintage sir you know it's uh you've been on the show for practic well for 20 plus years now. Um, you've done theatre, you've done TV, radio, etc. Technically, who's the most accomplished actor? Who, who do you actually admire the most? You know, who hits their lines and can, you know, and kind of really take direction from the director the most? Who do you go, you know what? Mm, you, you know, you, you're, doing, you're doing good work there. Who do you say? Are you talking about, you're not talking about Archer's cast, are you? Oh, yeah. There is no other world outside of Ambridge. Right, like okay. Other than the Marvel superhero. Well, you, so you spoke to Charlotte about this, did you? Because you must remember, you've asked me this before, and I think I said Charlotte. <laughs> well, um, well, this is I, I, I mean, about my, note, there's the, any the, number of people I could answer that question to. I think there's huge, I think there's just wonderful people in this. And mm. you know, the thing about radio, uh, uh, I used to work a lot with a director at Pebble Mill in the old days, and he once said to me, will you speak to this um, journalist who's coming in today to, to, he wants to talk to one of the actors about working in radio. And I said, well, what, I haven't a clue what to say. I, I, I just do it. And he said, well, um, the thing about good radio actors is they have to, they have to be quick. You have to, you have to, be able to read something on the page and make it sound like it's not on the page. And if you're not doing it right, you've got to be able to adjust very, very fast because there's no time to mess around. Um, and I think there's some, some people on, on the Archers are, are just wonderful. Um, and uh, yeah, Charlotte, I, I, think, um, I think Susan is a, is a work of art. I think I just, uh, I just absolutely, when I hear it, and and you know she's a she's a professor or something. I mean I don't know exactly what it is, but she is a she's an incredibly bright, intelligent woman, and she presents Susan. You never question it. You never. I, I never. I hear it, and I don't think of Charlotte. I think of Susan. Um, I think that's brilliant. Then then on top of that, there's all that thing that I think we've also spoken about, which is when you first come into the programme and you hear, um, 
you hear voices in the green room and these are voices you know like every like everyone else who's been brought up in a radio 4 family it's um these are voices i've grown up with uh and and that's that is still um it still gives me a free song you know 23 years down the line or whatever sometimes just hearing those voices and, and being in the same studio are you really aware that you are really part of the whole kind of tapestry of this kind of institution now do, do you feel like you are y yes it, it's a curious thing isn't it being being um being in something like the archers because you are you know it's very rare here i am talking on on screen and people seeing but that for the most part, you are invisible. You're not seen. You're heard, um, and that I think that's a great thing. I think I think we again. I think I talked about this before, but my partner used to be in a TV soap, and uh, extraordinary the imposition. No, I, I'm sure lots of people like it, and I'm sure there are lots of people who seek it, but there are also plenty of actors who actually kind of like to have a private life and and um during that period we didn't have a private life really because everywhere she went people were whispering and heads turned and um she found that very uncomfortable and I, I i must say i'm very happy with the anonymity of being in the archers but also very proud of being in it and i love the fact that <laughs> when you say are you aware of of, of being part of an institution like that god knows i am because as soon as you you know it, it's mentioned in any kind of a setting there's always someone if not quite a few people who are very excited and i mean i've had people i've had people literally stop breathing and so I, you know and not say i'm it's too much i can't speak because which it which is a which is bizarre but it's you realize how much it's a part of people's lives. And you kind of, you know, of course I do. Of course I realize that. And of course I realize, you know, it's a fantastic, fantastic thing to be part of. Well, we need to take a pause, sir, because um, there's two reasons why people turned up on a Friday with the sun blaring outside, you know, blazing outside, and they're, they're indoors. Um, it's because they want to see you and hear you, but also, they want to be part of the dum de dum quiz, right? So um, we're going to go on to our dum de dum quiz now. Everybody, you know the drill. Uh, it's you've got to get yourself pen and paper or pencil will do. Marker, anything, a uh, bit of chalk if you've got a blackboard. And we're going to play the dum de dum quiz. Now, first <laughs> off, first off, um, it's the pitch around. Now, this is an archer's thing or person. It's an archer's thing or person. What do you see here? We see a handsome man. We see um, a creature with wings and, and uh, a vehicle of some sort. That is an archer's thing or a person. So uh, scribble down your ideas. Uh, Michael, feel free to play along, sir. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm gonna taste this, by the way. So no pressure. But she's a she's a doctor. You did say she's 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 proper clever. Second one in the pitch around. What do you see here? Bit of a scene where people are in their Sunday best, and um, I don't know some kind of letter business over there, over on the. Right. What do you see? This is an archer's thing or a person? Question number three. Um, we have um, two people with eye patches. What the Dickens could that be? This is an archer's thing or an archer's person. When we say thing, could be a breed of cow. It could be a place. Two people with eye patches. This is the last one in our pitch around. Here we go. A couple of royals on the left. And then, I don't know what's going over there on, on the right. Uh, 
this is an archer's thing or an or a person okay that's the end of the picture round and then we're going to go on to our alistair lloyd round is our you. cricket playing bet so how long ago was this picture taken michael a good 10 years well, yeah you're looking good on it the, well, the very last kind. 10 years have been very kind to you so <laughs> Obviously, the, the 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 warm embrace of a good partner, security at work, no no problems in the family at all because you, you could have been taken yesterday. First question: After the Ambridge flood of two thousand and fifteen, what did Alistair do? Number one: Shout horse paintings. Number two: Become even more boring. Number three: Sell a share in his business. So after the flood of two thousand and fifteen, what did Alistair do? Number one, shout horse paintings. Number two, become even more boring. Number three, sell Have a again. clue. <laughs> <laughs> Question number two, folks. Um, after his marriage to Shula broke down, Hunky Al had a night of passion with Lavinia Rafferty. On finding out, Shula said, anyone but Lavinia Rafferty, why did she say that? Number one, because she owned a rival stables. Number two, she was a client of Shuler's. And number three, she was a member of the hunt. Why did Shuler say anyone but Lavinia Rafferty? She owned a rival stables. She was a client of Shuler's. And number three, she was a member of the hunt. Daniel's, girl Daniel's girlfriend, sorry, tried to snug our Alistair. What was her name? Was it number one, Erin? Number two, Chardonnay? Number three, Tabitha? That's a cheat because that's an Ambridge Extra question. It is. It is. It's, it's a deep dive. It's never, it it's never been dive. in the Archers. It's a deep dive, sir. Yeah. So Daniel's girlfriend tried to snug our Alistair. What was her name? Number one, Erin. Number two, Chardonnay. Number three, Tabitha. Alistair mentored who at Gamblers Anonymous? Number one, Ted. Number two, Ryan. Number three, Skaghead Steve. Who did he mentor at Gamblers Anonymous? Was it Ted, Ryan, or Skaghead Steve? And then our last one, look at you here. Oh no, oh my God. I'm, uh, listen, I'm lucky, I'm lucky because you know how on the screen there's a, a load of pictures of people who are watching. Uh, I'm, uh -huh. hid I'm hidden behind all those <laughs> because I know this picture. Uh, we, Judy and I have actually refused, somebody wrote in asking if they could have a copy of this. Mm -hmm. Well, you do have love in your eyes, sir. You know, I, it was it was going to be the biggest day of your life and uh, you, you look happy. So let's ask the question. When did Alistair marry Shula? Was it number one, 1999? If we're going to party like it's 1999. Or was it number two, 2001, a Space Odyssey? Or did he marry Shula on a cold day in hell? There you go, folks. Um, that is our picture round. We are going to come back to that. And we'll give you your answers. Um, Mr. Lumsden, um, you yourself have kind of said this right um, at the start when you talked about the precariousness of being Alistair and the fact that he got a divorce. But one of the great things for us, the listeners, is this, the, the triptych, the trifecta. It's you, your dad and Jazza. Um, was the was, I think I know your answer to this, but there wasn't any you weren't aware that they were setting up this kind of three legged odd couple, were you? Oh, goodness. Have we lost him again, everyone? Um, if you can hear me, can I just have a wave? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you, you're back. You're back, Michael. Michael? Michael Lumsden, can you hear me?
Let's mute you, Chris. We, we, we can hear you. Uh, uh, yeah, you're looking at me going, oh, you can hear me, Royfield. You're stirring away, sir. Um, well, until we get Michael back, I suppose I best speak to everybody. Lovely to see you, Dusty. Um, and we also have, uh, we have Red Agnes and Mandy Belshaw, Andrew Horn, as I live and breathe over there in, uh, is it is it Surbiton? Yeah, you're nodding. Uh, Mia Fox in Newcastle. Hello. Uh, Philippa, uh, my, my new best friend. Uh, she's, there you go. She, she's waving. Um, these are only people who, who, who I recognize and stuff. So Jane Curzon over in the corner there. Yeah. Um, hello, Megan, Eliza, Scott. And uh, we've got, oh, hello, Christina. You're in Norway, aren't you? Yeah, yeah you're, you're waving. Um, let's see who else we have here. I feel like a proper radio DJ here uh, trying to fill until we get Michael back. Hello, Pat Brown. You really helped us out, Pat, on the test uh, recording uh, that we did. Uh, Danielle, hello. Um, quickly going through this. Hello, Adam, who also helped us out on, on the live recording. And Audrian is over in Alameda, which is right next door to to me when I'm in Oakland or in uh, Vallejo in California. Now, Michael has just logged back on and I'm gonna find him and unmute him. And uh, Michael. Hi, back back. hello. No idea what happened there. I think it's probably that I just wanted to avoid having to answer the first four questions. I think you need to put another penny in the meter. Well, you've already put another penny in the meter, haven't you? Because you're back. So, yeah. so, so, so well done. Well done. Um, that was it. The, the, the dynamic trio. Um, one of the things which the archers, I would say, um, hasn't been brilliant at is male relationships in the last, I don't know, let's say 20 years. Um, it's interesting, um, speaking to Charlotte, um a couple of weeks ago well on the show on dum de dum i made the point of saying that if you if you listen back to old episodes pre about 1975 a lot of them i think are bordering on unlistenable to modern ears the way that they the delivery the direction etc and by the mid 70s you can listen to all of those old episodes and it was um somebody from the academic archers of which then charlotte chimed in and said on twitter that at that point around about the mid 70s when the first female writers actually came into the archers and there's a real change and there's a great quote um somebody saying that all of a sudden women were allowed to be uh, menopausal uh ha be, be, be postnatally depressed, et cetera. It was very much, and they weren't just making jam anymore. You know, so it really was noticed that the women were written much better. And I would say that um, one of the unintended consequences of that was actually male relationships were a little bit kind of 2D. Um, at least they have been in the last 10 years. Um, and it's one of the reasons why the three of you is, is so lovely to hear. How were you, re, are, for you, the actor, are you really very conscious that, that there has been this real change in the, in not just in the amount of lines that you're getting, but, but also with the, with the resonance, you're not just playing somebody's partner anymore are you you're not mm. just shawless husband who's a the odd occasional grunt it's a case of um you've got a father who went through is been suffering from a lifetime of the after effects of abuse and then you have um jazza who is a man child fundamentally a lovable man child we all love jazza but but that's what he is so um in terms of acting and, and, and the portrayal of, of alistair um, number one, where do you think it might go? And I, obviously I'm not asking for any definite storylines or anything like that, but, but also um, it must be much more joyous to play the guy now. Oh, absolutely. Um, 
Hmm. There's it's quite a lot of things you've you've mentioned there. Um, you know what? It was the wine. I didn't know where I was going. With <laughs> you don't know where you're going. I don't know where I'm going. Um, I, you know, again, you're sort of suggesting maybe I know where the storyline's going. Mm. I haven't the first idea. Uh, mm. All I know is that, um, I, as I said before, that it feels now like there are all kinds of directions it could go in. Um, I'm not in any rush for him to find new love mainly because it's kind of soap death mm -hmm. um it there are, you know it, it it's just that it tends to limit you in terms of, of what in terms of what the character might or might not do and the and the people the character interacts with so for me at the moment having that lovely trio of the three of them uh sharing the house together is joyous but there's also you know any other number of people he can he can relate to now without it being in any way a sort of threat to the marriage or uh or or that he would have to only relate to them as part of a couple so that's great that's that's lovely i quite enjoy the fact that i have no idea where it's going um and i, and I genuinely think at the moment the whole thing's up in the air anyway you know uh, um we know that things are having to be done very differently from uh, whenever it is about 10 days time, there's going to be this kind of new style um, for a period, but none of us know how long that's going to go on. Um, and that completely changes all the dynamics. So it's, you know, that's one of the great, I, I think that's a, a really positive thing about the, where we are at the moment, actually, that, um it's it's a it's a completely open book it's it's it, it, it could go anywhere um so i have no idea where it's going to go as far as i'm concerned i really like where it's at i love being being in in that trio the the, the tres amigos or whatever it, it, some people call it um and uh that that's been joyful to play uh john and Ryan are amazing and um you know I'm sure a lot of people will know Ryan is completely blind and doing scenes you know some of those scenes were very very difficult and and sometimes very difficult technically um and how he coped with it all and of course he unlike the rest of us has to learn it mm. And there were times when he was having to learn episode after episode after episode. And he always nailed it. It, it, it was, you know, working with those two was just fantastic. And I, and I just enjoyed it immensely. And, and I really hope, I know that it's got, that, that in, in general, I, I know the feedback has been positive about, about the storyline and about that, the relationship between those three. So I just really hope that, that that gets built on and there's more of that stuff because it's great, great fun. Do you think I also, I, I think it's quite interesting what you were saying about writers and how women writers came in, you know, started to dominate and that, uh, or, or started to be more. Yeah, they had a new, yeah. But I think, I think that there perhaps also was a time, not now, but I think there may have been a time when the program actually had almost all women writers and almost all women producers. Mm. And in a funny kind of way, uh, that is wonderful in some ways, but I also think that is that perhaps wasn't always helpful for the male characters. Uh, and, and there was a time I know when the program had a reputation that all the men in it, you know, all the men were kind of, a bit unexciting and I, I don't know and I, I, I felt there was a period and I'm not talking about now when um, you know the, I think I think the male characters became a little bit stereotyped and I don't know am I being controversial oh my god I, I, I think you're I don't mean to, I don't mean to suggest that, 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 that the, the women writers didn't understand men that's not what I'm saying but I think, I think and maybe more interested in women and fair enough you know that that needed rebalancing 
I think at the moment it, it's getting healthier, the, 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 the balance. Uh, I, I think so too. And there was that uh, Laurie and Fry sketch, wasn't there, where it's a case of um, here's another tired man on, on the archers. But let's be honest about it. It was to redress a historical imbalance that uh, the majority of the listeners have always been uh, female. However, it was written from a very male centric view and women just made jam for years. You know, there's the odd occasional, um, uh, you know, unexpected pregnancy, but women may jam for, for, for a lot of years. We only have about 50 minutes uh, left, uh, Michael. So yep. I'm going to throw out, um, I'm going to stop talking and it's going to be a case of, it's a bit of a free for all now, folks. So I've gone on to gallery view. This is when I need a drink and, and I've just run out. <laughs> so um, why, if you've got a question uh, for, for Michael, aka Alistair the Vet, um, wave now and I will unmute you and you can ask your question. So I am looking through, Adam doesn't want to ask a question. I'm very surprised at you, Adam. A lovely bandana, sir. You, you quite the look today, quite the look, sir. Um, go back. Oh, Danielle, you're up. <laughs> There you go. Hello. Hi, Can Danielle. You... Hi. Thank you both um, for tonight's wonderful viewing. My question really is, um, do you feel there's aspects of Alistair, just at this midpoint as we are now, that you would like to, um, you know, bring forward somehow, just at the point as he is now? As um... an in your role, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I think that's a fair, a fair question because I, I do feel that um, he got slightly submerged in, in being part of a, a, a rather bland couple, um, and I think there's lots of, there's lots of stuff that early on might have been explored that wasn't because of, because of that, um, and. I think I think in a way the why I was slightly complaining about the gambling story is that I think at that point the the, the powers that be wanted to give him something to to kind of give him something a bit more interesting. But actually, I think I think it made it was a bit sad and actually almost made him less interesting. So now I think that what we've what we've seen of his ability to empathise and and his building of his relationship with his dad and with Jazza. And the fact that that has now that release from from the marriage and and the way he's interacting with those other two means he's now kind of developed a a better sensibility, I think, and the yeah. way he handles other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I yes, I would love all that to be explored. You know, <laughs> it's out of our hands. You know, this is the this is the extraordinary thing about this program. You know, yeah. I don't know. Uh, because of the way things are being recorded at the moment, I don't know when I'm next, you know, going to be in it. Let alone what's going to what's going to happen to the character, mm. and, and I won't really know until, you know, one day the scripts plop through the letterbox. But yeah, I definitely feel that lots has been opened up. There's lots of possibilities for him now, and um, I really hope that that they do get explored. That that would be wonderful to see and I think there's a lot of more exploration in the story. Good. Well I do too. I share yeah. I share that with you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot, Danielle. <laughs> um I'm going back on to gallery view. Now um Chris, Chris it says Chris's phone and you're there. Hi, Hi there. Hi. Ask Hi. Away, Chris. Hi. Uh do you think there's any chance that Alistair and Shula will get back together? Um, I guess my reaction to that is it's the nature of these kind of programs that I think that will always be dangled. I think that will always be a possibility because if it's not, that's just a, a storyline. You know, I notice myself that every time she and I have a scene together where we get on well, there's suddenly a load of people on Twitter talking about whether or not they're going to get back together. And presumably for the for the 
producers and storyline writers, that's good. I personally would be quite surprised, but that, I'm, I, that, my, that view is no more valid than anybody else uh, who listens to the programme. I don't know. But um, I, I think they're probably both more useful characters and more interesting characters uh, released from the marriage. And I, from, my, go on. Uh, so, so, sorry. From Alistair's perspective, do you think it's something Alistair would like? I, I think uh, that it would have been in the first, probably the first year, nine months or a year. I don't think it is now. I think, I think he's discovered a, a new life and I think actually he would, I think <laughs> that he would now see it as a, as a backward step. He would see that, um, I'm saying all this, I, I can say this and, and next week I might get a script through the post where he's desperately <laughs> wanting to get back together with her. So, uh, you know, we, we, we are the tools of the script writers and, and the storyline creators. Uh, and we just have to go with whatever the flow is. And, and you know, it, it's not always what we would choose. So that's my personal feeling is that he wouldn't, he wouldn't be feeling that would be a good move. Um, cool. I'm gonna Thank quickly, you. quickly jump in. Rosie McGlynn, you were shaking your head uh, saying, oh my God, no, I don't want him back uh, with, with Shula. And by the way, that's a wonderful background you have there. So first off, what's that background? And then tell us why you were crossing your fingers when, when Michael said, no, he wouldn't get back with Shula. Thanks, Royfield. Um, it's the background to um, sort of the beach view in Portobello in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. So it's looking out to Lomond. Uh, so it's up in Scotland um, just a few days ago. We've had some wonderful weather and I'm very lucky to live here. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that what we've seen with the Jazzer, Jim and Alistair relationship has been an amazing tripartite, supportive, really awe-inspiring relationship. And it's given many of us a huge amount of joy and some tears along the way. And I think that even though Shula has played her role in being a support to the whole process and being there for Jim, I mean, basically Shula, you know, is gonna be off on her attempt to vicarage journey that's probably gonna fail um, because of her massively contradictory and pessimistic personality. <laughs> um, but I think that Alistair just is such a wonderful guy. And I think it's lovely to see him just being there for his dad. And I think that Jim, Alistair and Jazza are um, an ideal friendship relationship that a lot of us can aspire to. And I just hope that they carry on being there for one another. But also just really quickly, um, Joy Horville will not be any kind of romantic partner for anyone. <laughs> but she will you were about there. to suggest it. <laughs> no, but she, but, she, but she and Jim can be there in Madge the Midget saving Kirsty. Someone's got to get in there. And Jim and Joy did try and save the Corvid, whereas Alistair was like, put that bird down. So I would say that there's a bit of a simpatico between Joy and Jim. Wow. And Wow, do you mean Joy could be my mother-in-law? Only in a non, you know, physical <laughs> type situation, Alistair, Michael. Uh, Rosie, <laughs> can I just mm. say, that was a, a masterful question, and I like the way that, you, had, you know, you, you built the whole thing up. Do you want to do my job? Because, <laughs> you know, uh, Royfield, as, as, Rosie, as Rosie was speaking, I was you thinking, I, I'm sort of hoping there isn't going to be a question here because you've just said all, you've just kind of said all the things uh, I would like to say about that relationship <laughs> and about Alistair uh, far better than I could. So um, thank you. Thank you. That was, that was great. That was very nicely summed up. And I'm just trying to get my head around the fact, sorry, is that actually what is behind you? That's not a no, picture. No, so it's a picture of. So I oh, it is a picture. Thank I'm God. Port, no, I'm actually not on the beach spiritually. <laughs> in a, to what, you. a window, like, maybe? No, so it's. Um, I'll move away. So it's a picture. So um, I live in Portobello in Edinburgh, and that's a picture of a little boat crew out on the Forth. And the hills behind are the Paps of Lomond, apparently. It's towards Fife, anyway. I couldn't uh, actually. You were covering the boat. If if the if I'd seen the boat that it and it wasn't moving, 
<laughs> I would have known it was a picture. I, I thought the waves would move as well, Michael. But I yeah, I, no, I, I, I just you know this is a you know I'm looking at Friday a evening. And it's, it's not it's, all that clear. It's a multi-channel experience, Roy. Don't be so mean. Yeah, cheeky. Come on. Um, let, we've Thank got you time. so much. We've got time Thank you. one more question. So if anybody wants to um, wave, put their hand up. Nick and Neil, I'm looking at you two. You're looking around at you. Hey, hey, he's called us up. <laughs> yeah, How I, are you, gentlemen? Where are you at the moment? Uh, we're South Staffordshire, Consul, just outside Northampton. Oh, so just not, outside the Black Country, Yam uh, Yam Land. Yeah, yeah, not quite though. Not quite. <laughs> um, um, and how long have you been Archers fans? Oh, so I was listening when Justin and uh, was in the pantomime so, about two years ago. Okay. Uh, I've right. been... They don't even remember Alistair as the boring old character he used to be. Oh, no. So I did so I've been <laughs> about uh, 15, 16 years for me. Oh, right. Okay. I, oh, dear. I, I, I got him to listen. Eventually. I was introduced. All right. Well, listen, gentlemen, it, it's lovely to see you. Um, I, do you have a question? So I have probably a more light hearted question. Oh, go for it. And it, it's probably an old classic, but. Um, Alistair accepted, what one character would you love to play in the Archers? Oh, my God. Good question. Could be male or female. Yeah. Susan Carter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Everyone wants to be Susan Carter or Tracy. <laughs> oh, oh, it's difficult. Difficult. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I, I can't. It's never crossed my mind, actually. Isn't it funny? It's never something I've thought about. Um, it's, it, it's, it's, I, there's, there's characters I love, but it doesn't necessarily mean I would like to play them. I'm happy. Listen, I've spent 23 years trying to get, trying to get this one right. Um, <laughs> and I'm still working on it. So, uh, you know, I'm going to stick with that. And, um, uh, I'm, I, I just hope there's going to be enough of Alistair around over the next however many years and interesting stuff to play. And I, and I will carry on trying to kind of do it as well as I can. Um, there's lots of characters I love and I've talked about, yeah, I mean, obviously Susan and, and, and Tracy are fantastic, but there's, there's just so, there's so many great characters. I can't, I can't even begin to think about that question. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sticking to my own. I'm sticking to my character. We'll, we'll let you do that. That's all right. We're loving the new Alistair anyway. So. Good. Excellent. <laughs> I'm, I'm enjoying him a lot more myself. <laughs> Thank you, Nick and Thank Neil. Um, okay. We should um, go on to um, our pitch round. I'm going to quickly run through the, the questions again. And and then uh, we'll, we'll come up with, with some answers uh, for everybody. All right. So what do we have here? Handsome man on the left. We have a, a creature with wings top right. And then we have a, a bit of an 80s car uh, bottom right. So that's Matt Damon. That bird is a craw and that car is a Ford. Matt Crawford. Oh, so if you've got that right, big ups to you. Now, not Matt. <laughs> <laughs> well, how many Matts have there been in the Archers? Yeah, I couldn't remember his surname. Well, we'll give you half a point there. Uh, right, so we have a scene over on the left. It, it's a wedding. We all know that's a wedding. Um, there are people there have been escorted. They're ushers. And then we have two, not quite stamps, they're Franks. Not one, but two. Oh. That's Usher Franks. Oh. Now we have two people with eye patches, the singer Gabrielle over on the on the left, and then Nelson, the admiral on the right. Nelson Gabriel. Oh, um. oh, oh, is everybody still got me? Yep. Oh, all right. Why can't I move on? All right. Everything is locked up for me. Stop share. Let's get off that. You're with me, Michael. 
Yeah, I'm with you. I, I can hear right, you. Let's let um let's hope then that everybody else is still with me as well. Um, right. So what do we have over on the left? We have uh, Prince Harry with his son, and we have Rabbi Burns on the right. Harrison Burns. Harry's son, Burns. That's what we have there. And we're going to quickly just go through these. Um, after the flood of 2015, what did Alistair do? Number one, shout horse paintings. Number two, become even more boring for a time. Number three, sell a share in his business. He actually did all three. So you couldn't fail there. Hang on of a minute. Course. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you, you've got exciting now. But I meant directly oh. after the flood of 2015. But what? why did you say horse paintings, Alistair? You know what? I have absolutely no recollection of that. No memory of that whatsoever. You I, I thought a... for a minute you were talking about that time when Shula decided she was going to do life drawing and, and I couldn't no, recognise what it was she drew. That. This That's was quite recent, that. isn't it? You, uh, no, horse paintings? I, uh, you said horse paintings out of nowhere. But anyway, uh, we'll, we'll Were move. you drunk at the time you heard this? Were you... <laughs> you said something which approximated to the sound of horse paintings. It was all over Twitter at the time. Anyway, mm. mo moving on, sir. Um, after your night... Uh, oh, sorry, after your marriage to Shula broke down, you had uh, a night of passion with, with Lavinia Rafferty. On finding out, Shula said, anyone but Lavinia Rafferty. Why? Because she was a member of the hunt, was the next line. Uh, Daniel's girlfriend tried to snog you. Uh, what was her name? It'd hardly be Chardonnay. Couldn't, and it wasn't Tabitha. It was Erin. Alistair mentored who at Gamblers Anonymous? Can you remember? Can I? Yeah. Ryan. It absolutely was. It was Ryan, not Skaghead. I'm doing quite well on these ones. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from horse paintings. Hopeless. Um, Skaghead Steve is a character from Tiny Tim. I recommend anybody, if you want to have a giggle, go to YouTube, type in Tiny Tim. There's a guy, a Mancunian guy, who rings people up, does prank calls, pretends to be... Um, a three-year-old he says i'm three going on six and and then he always talks about uh, his uncle barry who uh, wrestles with his mum and uncle barry is a friend skaghead steve so um tiny tim on youtube he's utterly brilliant very funny guy when did alistair marry shula was it 1999 so we're gonna party was it 2001 a space odyssey or was it a cold day in hell which one was it michael 1999 it was indeed. And going to get out of there and we're going to go back. There we go. We're back. So um, I'm going back onto gallery view. Uh, thumbs up if you got all of those right. Oh, gosh. Look, look at you, miserable luck. Come on, those were easy. Oh, Rose McGlynn. Got it. Dave Hardin's pushed out his bottom lip. Um, anybody on... Anybody else get, get those right? Was it just Rosie this week? You got them all correct. Oh, MS, you got it right. MS, I'm coming to you, sir. You are an Archer's fan of some discernment. <laughs> do, you, do you get out in the evening? Do you have Do you have a life? I do. I podcast them, though. So I can go out in the evening and then listen in the daytime. Fantastic. Was there anybody else that got all of those correct? It was Rosie and MS at the moment. If you did... But uh, let's have a thumbs up. Stop shaking your head there, Danielle. And you, Red Agnes and Jane Kirsten, big thumbs down and a big thumbs down also from Erica. Well, uh, Michael, um, I think it's time to say Alfida saying, oh, we don't have Iris from Germany for us to say Alfida saying. So we'll just say Tara, basically. Um, I, I love the new Michael. Michael, are you with us? Please say you're with us, Michael. Michael's gone again. He needs to put another penny in his meter for, for more tinternet. All right. Well, um, what a way to end Dum De Dum Live, everybody. I hope you've uh, been right royally entertained. And next week, I forget who we have. It might be Kerry Davis, the writer. I think it is. Um, 
Yes, I'm not looking at my notes. And also uh, you can see the red wine uh, has been uh, totally consumed. I'm a little bit tiddly. So the last thing I'm ever gonna do is drink a, a large glass of red uh, whilst doing the show, because I feel a little bit squishy. Anyway, um, thank you for all well being- done, Boyfield. Thank you for all being part of uh, Dum De Dum Live. Um, you will thank you. I'm going to say thank you to Michael, but let's just pretend that he is here. Let's say thank you to Michael. Thank you, 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 thank you, thank you. Hello, thank Mia. Catherine Rowan Jones. Hey. Hello, Hello, Catherine Rowan Jones. Whilst I have you all here, oh, he's back. Michael is back. So, um, I'm going to mute you all. I'm going to go and find him, and we're going to have to say thank you again. So, um, unmute Michael. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm back. Oh, you froze me out. I, trust me, I did <laughs> nothing of the sort, sir. You really need to speak to your internet service provider and uh, tell them they're doing a terrible job and get, get a new one. Oh, right. <laughs> Um, well, we've basically said goodbye. So this is um, um, extras now. So I'm going to unmute everybody and they're going to show you their appreciation for, uh, for you allowing them to spend an hour in your company on a Friday. So you're unmuted all. There you go. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. There you go. And whilst I have all 50 plus of you, and hello, Philippa, again, um, can I beg and implore you, uh, go on to Apple iTunes, write us a review. Uh, Big up myself and Lucy. Uh, we, we love the archers as you do, but we're sweating buckets here. We're killing ourselves trying to put out this new content just to help everybody through this corona lockdown. So if you've got any modicum of joy, pleasure or insight from these extra shows that we're doing, go into Apple iTunes, write us a review. That'd be awesome. See you all again next week, same time for another rip-roaring edition of Dumby Dum Does Zoom. Tatty bye. <laughs>